Hello. Um, looks like we've got a few folks joining already. Um, let's definitely give a minute, or just just a minute and a half maybe to, for people to join. I see folks flowing in. Um, so great to have you all here. We'll, we'll say like a, a big hello in a minute. Feel free to make your way to your seats. Um, there are refreshments in the back. Not actually sure what's being served today, but I hear it's delicious. Um, let's kind of slowly start to introduce ourselves and again, give it not just 30 seconds or so for folks to join, but it looks like we've got a few folks here already, which is, is great to see. So, um, my name is Leo. I uh, will be mostly the one on screen today leading leading things um, and walking through the demo. Um, and I'm joined as well by my colleague, Sung. Uh, we kind of trade off on these. Sometimes Sung leads, sometimes I lead, and the other one is the chat champ. And so today, Sung will be relegated to mostly the chat champ role, which is an exciting one. And I really encourage you to make the best use of his his deep knowledge on these topics. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sung. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks, Leo. Hey, folks, my name is Sung, rhymes with lung like the air you breathe. And uh, I will be the chat champ. And what, what that'll look and feel like is uh, as you ask questions, I'll do my best to answer them within the chat slash based off my discernment, if it makes sense for Leo to verbally name the answer to that question, I'll pop my head back on the stage and just say, hey, Leo, like, this is a question worth answering live. Uh, and so, yeah, with that in mind, I'm going to go off stage and then I'll meet you folks in the chat. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Sun. Um, and I think we're uh, pretty much ready to get started. So uh, please do introduce yourselves in the chat. Uh, I hate for it to be just Sun chattering away. Um, and uh, so on that note, uh, it would be great if you could share just a quick hello um, and where you're dialing in from, uh, as well as um, your favorite, um, let's see, I'm gonna go with your favorite breakfast item. Classic, but everyone's got an answer to that one, hopefully. Um, I would say my favorite breakfast item is is a scramble with goat cheese, mushrooms, fresh thyme, and um, um, probably a Bloody Mary. Okay, so um, yeah, please introduce yourself and, and get comfortable and we'll get started. Um, so today we will be talking about across database migrations, which are hard, uh, and here is what you need to know. Um, we work with customers who are moving data from one database or one data warehouse to another, and the challenges are just massive. And we have a challenge, but also a lot of fun building tools that make this a problem that actually can be solved. Uh, so without further preamble, I'll get to um, explain that a little bit more specifically. Um, first of all, brief introductions. Again, my name's Leo. I've worked at various companies. As you can see, I kind of got started as a data practitioner, and now I focus more on um, data tooling. And then, of course, our chat champ, Sun, um, uh, is um, going to be in the chat, as we already discussed, um, and really appreciate him uh, leading the charge there. Um, he's, again, just got a wealth of knowledge, and I encourage you to um, make use of it, hammer him with questions, et cetera. OK. so. This is a little bit different from webinars we've done in the past, um, and I'm excited about that. We've got to keep it fresh. We want to share the latest and greatest from Datafold, and that is our ability to help you actually compare data between databases, um, declare a migration complete, get stakeholder sign off. So the idea here is that migrations can be big, daunting, uh, almost endless projects. Um, the need to to validate that they have been completed successfully is 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 strong. The need is strong, but the, it's really hard to actually do that. Um, and so this this is what we're going to talk about. Why migrations are hard. Uh, so this is our little table of contents. Um, you've got database challenges, validation challenges, and people challenges. And I'll touch on each of those and how we can help. Um, 
And then uh, finally, I'll walk through what I hope some of you are really excited about, which is a live demo of um, uh, Datafold's latest tooling in this area. So why are migrations hard? Type mismatches. We'll start with something really familiar and um, like seems basic, but how to solve it is not exactly clear. So basically, um, you you might have like an int in one database, a decimal in another. Um, interpretations of um, like how many how many decimals should be rounded. Um, that basically, whenever you compare two tables within date between databases, you're not going to have the same types. And so it's not a matter of finding the type mismatches or like solving them in some way, but rather we try to interpret um, what should be considered equal so that your attempt to validate data between databases is not super messy. Collation differences. So um, this is a, a somewhat new topic to me, but a really fascinating one. Basically different databases uh, sort data differently. And so when you try to compare data between them, you run into significant challenges in terms of how to actually, um, how to efficiently index and efficiently compare common primary keys. Naming conventions, again, like a very human problem. Um, one that I'm sure you've encountered, order ID versus order underscore ID. Um, so we've tried to build tooling to kind of uh, anticipate and, and make it really easy for you to solve any kind of mismatches that you might encounter. And finally, SQL syntax differences. So if you're moving from SQL Server to Snowflake, you're going to have to, at some point, update those scripts. Um, so you want to both update them efficiently in a way that just translates the SQL, just like Google Translate. And then once you've made that translation, you want to validate that the results are as you expect. And so that's kind of where um, comparing data between databases comes in as well. Validation challenges. So this gets at like the heart of what Datafold is doing to support your database migration. And those of you who know something about Datafold will also recognize this as really the core um, of what we do in general, which is take two data tables and compare them on a value level. We tell you what the differences are. That is a data diff. Um, to do this in the context of a migration is not simple. Uh, because you can't use SQL. You can't write a join to say, does the table in this database match the other? Um, you need some other approach. And coming up with that other approach leads to other complexities. So you might uh, decide to move the data from one database to the other and then compare it there, or maybe move it to some third place and then write that SQL join, right? So all of these things you could attempt to kind of circumvent some of the complexity and then get back to something more familiar like comparing two tables on common primary keys using SQL, but that incurs cost uh, as data moves across the network. Um, you start to encounter this um, almost philosophical problem where in your attempts to measure the problem, you introduce another variable, right? So I think of this as like a Schrodinger's cat situation where you can't measure something um, without also influencing it. I am probably getting the metaphor and the physics wrong. Uh, so bear with me. But the point is, uh, if you can't measure the data in place, then um, you risk impacting what you're trying to measure. Fine, right? So uh, even if you're, um, well, not even if, just kind of in addition to the cost of network transfer and the risk of data corruption, this all takes time. So this is, even though migrations are notoriously difficult to manage, um, you will uh, encounter common problems and we try to automate basically what other teams have needed to deal with before and we can help automate. Finally, people challenges. Um, so it has been said that many data challenges come down to people challenges. You have stakeholders who you're trying to convince to use the new system instead of the old. Um, you have systems that need to depend on some upstream system, right? And so to actually make that jump and make that leap, there needs to be trust. There needs to be consensus that it's time to um, it's time to make that switch. 
um, to agree that the migration is complete. It's kind of related to what I was just saying, but basically what what at what point do you say, okay, the data looks the same, it still looks the same, it still looks the same. Okay, I think we're good to go. You don't want to be in a situation where you're kind of just closing your eyes and hoping that um, the validation you you ran is enough that maybe a row count that you ran or like um, some dashboards look close to the same but never quite the same. Was the old system really correct? Like at some point, just having that exact comparison is going to really help you move forward. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you might have downstream systems that depend on what you're trying to migrate. And so um, orchestrating all of that, basically any drag in this process will multiply in the sense that if you have like a um, not a rigorous way of making sure the data actually matches, then you will um, then then any attempt to move the downstream system is going to be almost multiplied in its complexity. Um, and finally, people problem. This is more like one that you might be feeling, or uh, I know one that I felt when I was at um, early in my career. I was kind of surprised, was surprised to find myself in the midst of a data migration to a brand new like fact and dim model. Um, it was my first experience with the words fact and dim. And um, I attended weekly meetings hearing about the progress of this migration. You know, I was responsible for a small part of it. And it just went on and on. I think it started before I left, joined the company and continued after I left it. And no one wants to be in a situation where by the time the migration is complete, it's time to begin the next migration um, because technology changes potentially faster than we're able to actually complete a migration. So that's the um, you know landscape we don't want to be a part of. So what do we do to solve all these problems I'm describing? Um, I'll walk through a few slides and then um, and, and these slides attempt to correspond with um, what I just walked through, hopefully mostly one to one. Um, and then I will pull up Datafold and walk through a demo, um, hopefully kick off a few diffs live, walk through a couple of uh, bleeding edge features that I'm excited to share and then um, take any questions. And I am just going to um, glance at. I know Sung's probably tackling the chat. Yep, breakfast and Sung in the chat. All right, good stuff. Um, ah, so type mismatches. Um, that's the first thing I mentioned. So um, you can see here, this is basically how we approach type mismatches. For the most part, in a migration context, you would expect um, the types to basically match, but not quite. And that's what we see across the board here, big int to int, numeric to real, character varying to end text. Um, I will be frank about, you know, when we first launched um, cross database diffing, we didn't know what challenges we would encounter like entirely. This is not this is a relatively new um, tech. Uh, you know, we're trying to pioneer this and we have learned a lot along the way. And one of the things we've learned is that this is the kind of automatic mapping that people need. Otherwise, they get all kinds of errors and warnings and that's like not that helpful. Yep, so um, got a couple of text bullets here, which I'm voicing over, so I'll remember to click forward for those on the next slide. Yep, so collation differences, I mentioned this earlier. You can, what you're seeing in the um, screenshot here is um, a list of the primary keys that are exclusive to one data set, but not the other. So you can see there rows exclusive to B. We always are speaking in terms of A versus B, data set A to data set B, and you'll see this more as we get into the UI. Um, so the screen, the, there's not like a great uh, image for me to share in terms of data uh, type collation, but the, the point here is that um, we do efficiently identify missing or added primary keys. We match between primary keys to um, identify differences in other columns. And um, just to give you a sense if this collation topic is brand new to you, um, think about alphanumeric characters and Latin characters, you might have heard of ASCII characters. There are so many characters when you think about languages with different alphabets, um, languages that are more character based, um, as well as just any kind of um, strange symbol under the sun um, that could be used in a primary key. 
And that is where this ordering becomes really complicated. And um, we are doing our very best to do heavy lifting that then you won't have to think about in terms of when you're actually trying to do these comparisons. Again, we try to keep it under the hood so that then you're able to just say, these are the common primary keys. Um, and we not only are able to find them, but find them efficiently. And that's where sorting becomes really, really important. Column remapping. So again, this is um, almost a mo much more human uh, problem, but you can see there um, movie ID to movie ID. There's a, only a slight difference, which is that capital I. Um, but you might have underscores. You might have a brand new column uh, naming approach. And uh, you, you want to make sure those names columns actually map up. It sounds kind of obvious as I'm saying it. But if you think about it, if that information isn't provided and there's not an easy way for you to do it, as you can see here in this like diff creation form, uh, which we'll get into in the demo, um, then we would data fold, you know, the machine would have no way of knowing that these were the same two columns. And we we try very hard not to, to resist the temptation, frankly, of, of guessing um, <clears throat> as fun of a technical problem as that may be. Um, you know your data best. Uh, and sometimes a wrong guess can be worse than nothing at all. So the idea is we just try to make it as easy as possible for you to map column names. By the way, all of this is possible using our API. Um, we have people who you know, log into the UI every day and hammer away at their migration validation. And then we also have teams who automate it using API calls. Did I, um... Yep, okay. Um, and then SQL syntax differences. So um, I'll walk through this as well in, in the demo, but basically you can see our handy SQL translator. Um, this is powered by SQL Glot, and it is really, really cool. Like I, I go here when I, when I, I need to, um, well, put it this way, I, I work with all kinds of databases, but I'm not as familiar with all of them. Um, our customers work with that large range of databases that you saw me flash on the screen a few slides ago. And so sometimes I need to do something or recommend something and 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 translate it on the fly. Um, in your case, it might be more that you have ETL scripts or or um, you know maybe um, any kind of stored procedures that you need to translate from SQL Server to the equivalent in Snowflake if that's the migration you're undergoing. Feel free to ask any questions in the chat. I see some active chatting going on, so I love that. Um, I, I won't get too distracted, but um, if there's something that I'm saying that you want to know more about, please, please ask. All right, validation challenges. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, downloading the whole data set is expensive. It's time consuming. You could introduce errors. As far as the Datafold Cloud diffing algorithm, um, the key thing to know is that we're not we're, we're executing SQL on both databases. Um, we are using techniques such as um, hashing to um, draw conclusions about each database, and you know we um, we then we then pull what we need from your databases into the Datafold um, application to actually execute the diff. So the idea here is that again, if you were just going about this from scratch. You might you might come up with some kind of similar approach. You might say, "Oh, I'll just download and compare everything." Our claim and what I've seen in practice is that that does drag on. It does kind of blow up in complexity. Um, it's not that this stuff can't be done, you know, in a homegrown manner. It's more just that we uh, we are specializing in this and we're trying to help people out and really build something that is adaptable to to your use case. Um, so pretty excited about the latest algorithm updates. You might have heard us launching uh, v2 of this algorithm on social over the last couple of days. Um, it's just been really exciting to see it progress and um, and both get faster as well as um, better integrated into the UI so that you can get the data you need um, as soon as it's available. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second as well. Um, before I get there, um, column level lineage uh, is something that you know you might have heard a lot about these days. Folks are really excited about, and there's a particular use case in the context of a migration, which is that if you need to 
if you have thousands or hundreds of tables and you need to validate that they have migrated successfully, time is of the essence, compute costs are of the essence, you don't want to be validating something that you don't need to validate. Um, Datafold's diffing algorithm is fast, but it's not, you know, magically or just sort of inexplicably fast. The more data there is, it does take longer. And so what you can do with column level lineage is discover what maybe doesn't need to be moved over, what doesn't have relevant downstreams. Um, so you might have, for example, one table that has many downstreams, but then um, only three of those columns are contributing to the downstreams. And so in order to actually validate the, that the table, the relevant pieces of the table match, you only need to select three of the columns instead of potentially hundreds. And so that would have a significant impact on runtime. Um, I also, I don't know if any of you have ever moved. Um, as a uh, proud millennial, I have moved many times and um, one strategy I have is to not move things uh, when, unless I really need them. And you can do the same with your with your database migration. Hope that didn't hit too close to home for any anyone out there who's moved a lot. Um, diffing stops once you have the information you need. This is really important, and it pertains to something I just touched on, um, which is getting you not only diffing fast, but getting you the information fast. So this per column diff limit, it takes a minute for it to click, and I hope the demo helps. But the idea basically is that is that you um, we we give you the option of setting a limit such that if if there is a number of differences in the column that's very large, we don't continue to find them all. Um, we stop once we hit the limit just for that column. Um, so I won't I won't use more words to describe it. We'll get to the demo. Um, hopefully that made some sense, uh, but I know it can be a demo is worth a thousand words. Um, finally, real time diff results. I'm super excited about this. Um, this is in, um, you know, we're just launching it right now. So I'm actually going to show you a test version that is, um, you know, being worked on this morning, but we're rolling it out to, um, to customers as we speak. Um, and so basically the idea is diff results are coming in and you don't need to wait until the entire table has been diffed to see them. Um, this can help speed up your decision making. You could potentially cancel the diff if you see what you need to see. Um, and then kick off a new one once you've corrected something or just say, I already know uh, what, what I need to know. Finally, I don't have any more than just one slide for this one, um, but this whole topic of getting stakeholder buy-in, um, convincing people that the job is done, uh, you'll notice here there's a bunch of green check marks in this image. This might be what stakeholders wanna see. Now, maybe they wanna see some differences, but bear with me. Um, the idea here is that we have some teams who are, are, are using Datafold results, either a screenshot or sending the URL to a stakeholder um, to get their sign off. Like quite literally, they require these results to be shared. And once they're shared and they look good and they smell right, then um, the job is complete. Um, I will note that this is you know, shareable across your, your team, um, we allow unlimited view only licenses. And so that is something that's just can, can be very valuable. You don't have to be like a, um, a Datafold full on user in order to get this benefit. And in fact, the, the main Datafold users get a lot of benefit by communicating this information to others across the org. And it seems it's time for a demo. So I will, um, take just a moment to do some moving of windows around. Here we are. And jump right into it. All right, so I've got a few things set up here. Um, bear with me on the little bit of a messy demo instance, but um, I hope it'll be worth it to you. All right, so I'm going to jump into a couple of examples and then I'll show you, uh, I guess, different iterations of how this might go about. And I'm trying to I'm trying to show you examples that give you like a full full picture of what this looks like. 
So, um, and, and I'm going to try to touch on all the features that I've mentioned. So basically, you're, what you're seeing here are the diff results. Um, you see this little note about the per column limit, per column limit reached. Um, we'll get back to this um, and how you can either use it or work around it. Um, and uh, yeah, we just try to give you all the all the levers you need to get get the information you need. So basically, what we're comparing here are two tables. So this is a Postgres table and a Snowflake table. Um, so walking through the results, you've got um, uh, analysis of row count difference, the number of different rows. So this is this is combining your any missing or added primary keys as well as differences found in individual columns. And you can see the at least language here. So this is because of that per column limit. Um, if the per column limit is not reached, then this would be exact. Um, digging a little deeper about this per column limit, because I just think it's an important topic and um, I don't want there to be confusion there. These are the columns with differing values. So you can see user ID, total runtime seconds, and org ID. And org ID is the one column of the three that reached the per, per column limit. So any columns that did not reach the per column limit, you'll see the exact number of differences. So I hope that makes some sense. Um, it takes a minute, I know, for that to sink in and like why that would be beneficial. Um, and please ask questions in the chat if you are wondering about that. But hopefully as I kind of hammer out these examples, it'll start to click. So this, these are the diff results. So um, I realize some of you may not have even seen a data diff before. I slightly regret that I didn't uh, open with a slide just showing you this visual. Um, but the idea here is that it's a git diff, but for data. So walking through this, you have your primary key column, and then all the common columns that you've chosen to diff, and then the value in A, Postgres, compared to the value in B, Snowflake. And so you can see here, all of these um, differences, or many of them at least, appear to be null to one. So this is an example where you might see, okay, there's some different interpretation of this column. Either it's an accident and it shouldn't be one, or like we know that all of these nulls should change to ones. And hopefully that is enough for you to act on after only about a minute of runtime for over a million rows in this comparison. On the other hand, there's little differences in these other columns. Actually, let me go to this columns tab where you can see this um, really clearly. So everything's identical except for these three. And this is the one where that limit was hit. So we stopped diffing. And then these are the ones where there are um, a smaller number of differences, which I'm about to dig into. Um, so let's do that. So what I can do here to dig in, actually, the easiest way is just to unselect org ID. That's the one with many differences. And then suddenly you can see these teeny little differences in total runtime seconds. So you'll notice that when I unselected org ID, then um, we're only going to display here uh, rows that have differences. So as you change what is displayed, that'll actually change what um, which rows are selected because we're trying to show relevant rows. So you can see org ID. These are the ones with differences. They're highlighted. So hopefully that makes it pretty clear. But let's go back to event ID, your primary key, and then the other two columns with differences. Yeah, and so you can see here, um, where are we? You can see here, um, 176 rows different in runtime seconds with these minor, minor little differences. And then in user ID, if I, um, oops, wrong button, if I click on this and show only the differing values, then that highlights these in the context of, if I reselect all of these, I'm showing only the differing values in in this row, so only those relevant rows um, in the user ID column, but all of the other rows in context. So hopefully that gives you a lot of different ways of exploring this and getting um, the relevant information. Um, the one other tab I haven't uh, mentioned yet is this primary keys tab. So this is basically showing you, I kind of hinted at this earlier in the, um, in, in the slide, but these are the rows that exist in B. So that's the existing Snowflake. And somehow they are missing from Postgres. So either they were deleted from Postgres or something went wrong in the transfer of data. Okay, 
So I want to also show a couple of other things here. Um, first of all, this, and I'm gonna get, I wanna walk through one other diff example. So um, bear with me, but just to spice things up a little bit and introduce some variety, I'm gonna um, show you an example here of how this SQL translator works. Um, so again, this goes back to the context of, you have ETL scripts, you have stored procedures, um, so you can see here, this is SQL Server dialect, and then I could translate this to Snowflake, and it'll look pretty similar, um, but you can see a few differences like this convert, switches to cast. Um, I think that's the main difference that we're seeing here, um, but hopefully that gives you a sense for how that's like basically instantaneous and just, uh, Hopefully this saves you the trouble of ever, you know, going to um, some random Google site or like all the various docs, docs that you might need to look through to, to come up with um, every possible SQL translation that you need to execute. Okay, so back to diffing examples. I walked through, I believe I, we were looking at um, Postgres to Snowflake. I want to actually, I want to go back to this one because I want to show you one more thing that you might do. So the per column diff limit was reached. Um, so you have a couple of options here, right? Um, you could increase the per column diff limit. Um, you might also want, want to clone the diff, um, remove the column that is introducing all of those differences because you know, or rather you've drawn your conclusion and you might wanna just share something simpler without all that noise to a colleague. Um, and it was org ID, I believe, that had all the differences. Um, and you can you know, select or unselect any columns in the diff. You might notice I had unselected certain things that might have sensitive information. Um, so that's something that you also have full flexibility on. Um, and then once that is, once I've selected those columns, this will take probably about a minute to run. So we can do something else while it's running, but um, that just gives you a sense for how, um, you can you know, iterate on these, um, hopefully getting information quickly uh, and, and not letting your database or your warehouse run more than it needs to, not waiting around um, while Datafold is drawing these conclusions. Okay, so a couple other things. Um, I do wanna just show another example here. Um, this is SQL Server to Postgres. Um, so pretty similar, um, but just to see this in a different context, again, we hit the, per column limit in one column, not in the other. Uh, we, we find some exclusive primary keys. And yeah, so hopefully this is starting to give you a sense for how you might use Datafold to validate your migration. Here's a good example of where highlighting only the differences seen in user ID, but um, this happens to be a column where there's differences in both. Like I showed you earlier, you can show all the columns to see them in context. And, um, you know, hopefully, Oh, uh, this this is starting to make some sense. Um, okay, so let's go back to check on the progress of this diff. You can see here, this completed in just over a minute. Um, now we're only seeing differences in two columns. We do still see all the other columns um, validated as identical, but now there's just another added to this list of not diffed um, because I did not select it. All right, and the last thing um, I think I want to touch on here is this net new um, experience that we're shipping. So I'm just going to go ahead and clone this diff. Uh, uh, there's one other thing, one or two other things I want to show you that I'll uh, I'll pull up while we're waiting for this to kick off. So this is this was set up for me by. Uh, uh, friend over on our engineering side. So I'm just gonna kick this off and run. But the idea here is that um, after an initial process, so there is like an initial, um, essentially like a table scan. So we're not gonna see anything quite yet, but we're gonna start to see values actually load in this page. So, um, and so that's this real time results that we're, we're, we're shipping pretty much this week. Um, so while we're waiting for that, I do wanna show you one other thing here, which is just to highlight something that was brought up in the slides. Um, column remapping, so version to app version. Just wanted to call out that that is 
something that you might want to um, you might need to do uh, potentially at scale. Uh, we do also have an egress limit. Um, so that's like if you have a really high per column diff limit or you are just like diffing a huge table and you want to make sure data hold doesn't download more than a certain number of rows because that could cause any kind of like network problem. We have safeguards in place for that. Um, down here you can see that column mapping is um, uh, kind of corresponds directly to what columns you can select. And finally, um, you can materialize diff results to um, your, your database. And that might be if you want to, um, you know, if the, the interactive UX of the values tab is not doing it for you and you want to be able to um, uh, explore those results in a more SQL-based interactive way. So um, the key thing to note here, I'll, um, ah, I'll turn this on and now you should start to be able to see results streaming in. Um, so hopefully we'll get to see that. I'll just leave this screen open and hopefully we'll get to see, there we go, something popping in there. So the idea here, again, this is like, I'm just like really happy this is, this is available because to me, this is like the per column diff limit helps a lot, but this is kind of the gold standard of, okay, as soon as we have the information for you, we will give it to you. And then that will allow you to draw conclusions quickly potentially cancel the diff to save yourself the time and save your warehouse of any, you know, unnecessary cost or activity, um, or, you know, maybe cancel it and restart it with something fixed and then have a, a diff that doesn't find a lot of changes, but instead just validates that everything is as it should be. So, um, yeah, you can kind of see how that is playing out. Um, and I think that is pretty much what I wanted to touch on. Um, and yeah, so I happen to see in the chat and I'm pausing, so I'll just answer you, Lewis. Um, can data diff configs and settings be under version control or does it exist solely in the UI? So what I would say to that is if you're really looking for version controlled configs, um, probably the best approach would be using a REST API and storing your, um, your calls in, in a, Git, a Git repository. So you can see, you know, we've got pretty pretty detailed documentation here on how to create a data diff. Um, the other thing is that, um, yeah, thanks, Sung. The other thing, and this is a um, um, something that we're going to um, be focusing on a bit more in in future weeks. Um, but just to give you a sense for it, you can see here you can configure diffs to be run on a recurring basis every five minutes, um, every day, and so that is something that might also be of interest. So it's not exactly a version control, but it is um, like a saved configured diff that you can um, execute on a recurring basis and store the results and kind of review them as a group. Um, yeah, so I think that is pretty much what I wanted to cover. I know I've, um, I'm starting to run out the clock here. So, um, Sung, why don't you why don't you join and um, we can just like touch on anything that's come up in the chat that I missed um, and take any questions as they flow in. I would love to hear you know any any more questions that you all have that I've hopefully provoked. No, I think you did a good job overall. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, we already answered Lewis's question, or you did verbally and I did with a script, and so yeah. So we're gonna treat this like a fireside chat for the next six minutes or so, and then. Feel free to post your questions and then we'll answer them live. Um, looks like Eric, you're typing, so we'll give you a moment to, to finish that up. Um, yeah, thanks, Song. As yeah, as Eric's typing, um, I do want to call out um, Rocket Money. I, I wanted them to be featured here um, because they are doing they are doing a really interesting combination of what we've talked about. They are like kicking off these dips in the UI. They're they're using it to like rubber stamp their um, audit compliance process. Um, and so they're just like a fantastic example of, um, you know, sharing the URL or sharing a screenshot of the diff results to someone who might never touch data fold or might not use SQL, but they, they need like absolute confidence that the data matches between A and B. Um, and then, uh, yeah, FAIR and uh, Eventbrite that I showed on the previous slide. They're some of our early migration customers um, and we're bringing on 
some more today. We've got a few, maybe even some on this call, who are right now in the midst of um, pretty intense migrations that we're we're working with. So um, yeah, if there's nothing else, um, I'd love to hear. You know, if there's anything that particularly resonated with you um, in the chat, or like again, any question um, is is a migration something you're like planning in the near future or undergoing right now um, would be really interesting to hear and uh, also give some other folks on the line something to learn about, you know, this this esteemed gathering of webinar attendees. Um, so I'm gonna, while while folks are thinking if they if they want to share um, any, anything on your mind around like, um, you know, you're working with folks on migrations, um, you're you're helping push the product forward. What what do you want to? What do you want to add, if anything? This, I think what's really nice about cross database diffing is it it validates the quiet part out loud that we're all going to diff eventually. Um, even use proxies to diff, where I've literally seen, and this is during my consulting days, where you have like literally like dozens of tabs open, and you're doing some like select star from limit five, an old system, a new system, maybe download to CSV if you want to like you know codify those differences, but everyone eyeballs to a certain extent. And there may be times where you have really, really good eyeballing sessions, maybe five times in a row, but you're not gonna do that 50 times in a row. You're not gonna do that hundreds of times in a row. That's why um, for those of you that work at organizations that have been through migrations, like it can cost millions of dollars because it's just, you're hiring an army of people to do literally what I just said. And I wanna live in a world where that doesn't have to be the default choice each and every time, that there is like just a much more better and elegant way and just a much more automated way. Um, so you don't have to always play guessing games or think like, oh, like I know this is gonna take 10 tabs and 30 minutes of my time for like, maybe if I graded the experience like a B minus at best, right, of validation. And you know, your data diffing experience should just be A at minimum. So yeah, that's, that's how I think through this and that's why I'm excited about it. Yeah, I would just add, thanks Sung, I would just add, um... Uh, the VLOOKUP as another approach that um, uh, might be used. Um, so yeah, if you've ever done like a VLOOKUP on a primary key between two Google Sheets, that's essentially the same thing. And, you know, we, we see kind of all all over the map. Like when I was in my last analytics job, I was, I was um, trying to do something like data diffing, ended up trying to build my own thing. It like kind of worked, but it was just like this massive infrastructure project that only I uh, understood and, and didn't always work. So um, yeah, so Eric, cross database diffing, um, we do have an open source project called uh, data diff. And there is some cross database diffing functionality in there. Um, happy kind of talk, talk you through what what the differences are, but there's going to be in the cloud product, there's going to be expanded um, database support and scalability, um, column remapping, extra or like additional primary key types so only um like many textual primary key types aren't going to be well supported in open source um that's that collation topic i was uh dwelling on earlier a lot of column remapping um and i think the big one honestly is going to be scalability if there's like a significant number of differences um then the open source product starts to starts to slow down um so yeah, we do have our we do have our our beloved um, open source project data diff. Um, this is really meant to everything I've talked about here. Basically, is is um, Datafold Cloud, and that's what we are. Um, that's what we're uh, excited about sharing today. Any other any other questions out there? I think I saw a couple other typing, but if not, I'm happy to wrap up um, and we will share, let's see, Sung, would you do me a solid and just share a link for our, our meeting in there just because I'm afraid of toggling too many things on my screen right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so if you all, of course you can reach out to us, you know, by, um, by email, um, you can find us in the DBT Slack if that's somewhere you hang out under tools data fold, um, but Sung and I spend every every day we talk to people about their database migrations. You know, it can be uh, informal. We can help you set up with a trial um, and just really get the ball rolling and, and kick the tires for yourself. Um, thanks a lot, Sung. So 
So yeah, I think that's pretty much what we wanted to cover. Um, please do follow up, uh, get in touch. Um, would love to hear what you're tackling, what your stories are, and um, see if, if what we've shared today will help you get where you need to be. All right. Beautiful. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Enjoy all those right. uh, breakfasts. I browsed your, your favorites. Uh, I agree with them all. All right. Peace out. Bye-bye.